Mike, and after to introduce Mike. Thanks, everyone. So uh, it's great to have you for this semi face-to-face -face, uh, meetup, the first one we're doing like this. So uh, yeah, today, actually, it's been a while since we did our last Java user group. So it's glad to see you guys again. And uh, tonight we will have a presentation about the Internet of Value and digital assets. And we are glad to have Mike Anderson with us. So uh, yeah, Mark is uh, partly CTO for a company called Datacraft and partly the managing director of the Convex Foundation, which is a foundation for the Internet of Value and with a framework. So the idea is first to present the Internet of Value to you and what this means. And then we will do some, as usual, some live coding. So yeah, thank you everyone. And we will have like, as usual, questions and answers in the end. Thank you. And uh, last for the newcomers, uh, if you want to rename uh, your name as uh, Jedi or whatever, uh, you can, it's to celebrate May the 4th. So May the 4th be with you tonight uh, with Mike. Um, thank you, Mike. You can, you can start and uh, you can open uh, your Lovely, thank you very much. So let me just share my screen. Uh, just double check if this works. Yes, and you can open your mic and your volume. I can open my volume. And soon I confirm. Yes, I'm mute. You need to reshow your presentation. Okay, can everyone uh, can everyone see this? Okay. No, you need to reshow And now you can share. Yes. Okay. Looking more promising. All good. Fantastic. Well, um, great to uh, great to meet you all. Um, so today I'm going to be doing uh, a talk about um, the Internet of Value and. Uh, digital assets and how we can we can use that with uh, with Java. Um, so I've been a I've been a Java coder since about 1997, right about when the when the first versions were coming coming out. So it's quite exciting still to be using Java in this day and age to build a system for the Internet of Value, which I think is a very exciting space um, that's that's really going to become a big a big game changer in in, in the world that we live in, and that includes you know obviously the things like cryptocurrencies, but I hope in this talk I'll give you a bit of a flavor that there's actually a lot more that can be done with these kind of technologies in the future. So it's a very, very exciting time to be alive and, uh, and, and working on these kind of products. So I wanted to share a bit of that, these ideas uh, today. So what I'm gonna talk about, first of all, I'm gonna go a little bit into that. Okay, so what are digital assets? Um, and why, why, why should we be interested and why is this different from what what's been done before. Second, I'll spend a bit of time talking about Convex, which is a platform that we're building for the Internet of Value at the Convex Foundation. It's an open source platform, and uh, I'd say it's an improvement over some of the uh, more traditional blockchain technologies. And it is, of course, 100% Java, Java implementation. So it's all Java technology through and through. So I'll give you a flavor of what we're doing with that. And then finally, I'll go more into the sort of the practical part where we'll actually, you know, do, do some stuff with digital assets and show how you can use the Java libraries to create digital assets, um, to launch new kinds of smart contracts, and how working with these kind of technologies uh, might look in the future. So I wanted to start with sort of a big idea, which is what's making the whole internet of value and decentralized space possible. 
And an observation of the original internet is that what you fundamentally have is this amazing open network, but the actual entities which are connected to this network are these private servers that have their own databases, have their own, their own application code, their own application logic. And the internet is really just serving as a communications channel between all of these different um, systems. And we'd regard these maybe as centralized systems because they're generally under the control of a single entity, whether it's, whether it's Google or government or, or a, a, a small business. Um, these are systems which are basically operated by a single organization. Even if they might be distributed, they might have big clusters, they might have many, many components, but they're still under a centralized control of some sort. Now, the big change which is happening right now is that the system of storing data and, and code is moving into the network. So rather than having all of these, decentral, these, these centralized systems connected by a communication channel, we're actually putting the systems into the network itself, a decentralized system which executes code and which stores data as part of a network. And this is a network that nobody controls. It's an open decentralized network. And that enables us to do some very interesting different things. You know, you can have, you can see what's happening and you can trust what's, what's operating in this decentralized system. It's, uh, it's no one has the ability to change the data or execute code without following the rules. So, I mean, why, why is this important for economics? Well, having this decentralized state, this, this database that's sort of shared and, 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 and you know, um, and operated according to some defined rules, you can actually use that database to store things like um, who owns what assets. So the classic, the classic case would be to have some kind of, some kind of token when different people can own a different amount of different, different, different tokens, and you might have Alice with a thousand tokens, Bob with 300, Charlie with 100, et cetera. And rather than having all of it, many different systems trying to track who, who owns what, you can rely on this single source of the truth, which is the decentralized database. And this is exactly what Bitcoin does, it's what Ethereum does and various different blockchain systems basically work on this point that you've got a decentralized ledger that stores the ownership of various different assets. And you can imagine these assets being a cryptocurrency, but they could also be something you know, more, more, more practical for a business, like let's say reward scheme points, or pretty much anything that you wanted to create, you, you can build some kind of digital asset which represents these amounts. Loans, derivatives, um, I'll go into some more examples later, but you know it, it, the, the flexibility of this concept is very wide. It's just ultimately a database with, with some code that supports it. So you can implement whatever kind of asset is interesting to you. So what makes a digital asset? What's, what's important about it? The properties are, I mean, it's, in order to be an asset, it has to be something that has value. Uh, so someone's got to want it or find it useful in some way. Um, even if that's just a subjective value, they want to, they want to own it because it's, it's interesting to them. Um, it can represent a right to use some other system or resource. So we have these things called utility tokens, which give you the right to consume various different kinds of, uh, uh, of decentralized resources or net network resources. It needs a method of defining ownership. Um, which in turn requires some sort of sense of identity, but you have to say who owns these assets. And generally it also requires a notion of quantity. You know, you've got 10 of them, you've got a hundred of them, you've got a mil million of them. Um, it also needs this concept of control. So having ownership of an asset typically gives you some special rights. Uh, the kind of rights you might have is you might be able to use that asset in a smart contract. So you might be able to exchange the asset for other assets, or you might be able to put the, the asset into an auction so different people can bid on the asset, if you imagine some kind of asset that represents uh, property, for example. Uh, or you might have rights like destroying an asset. If you want to get rid of it, you could only the owner or the, the, the creator, the owner of the asset would typically have that ability. And finally, there's, there's generally got to be a sense of transferability. It's a digital asset, 
there's got to be a way of moving that ownership to someone else. Now, if you've got these properties and everyone understands and trusts these properties, then you can start using digital assets to represent things of real value in the real world, or indeed new kinds of digital assets, virtual assets um, that might exist um, in a purely digital sense. And how do you actually, um, I mean, this is the conceptual view, the conceptual view about how you make use of these assets is, first of all, you're starting with some initial state that describes the database, the, the state of the world, uh, who owns what assets. You then have a transaction, and the transaction is some kind of instruction to the decentralized network to perform some operation. Uh, but in the case of digital assets, you have a command something like, I would like to transfer 150 of my tokens to someone else. And of course, this needs a digital signature. So in order to ensure that only the owner can spend the assets that they possess, we, we typically use a digital signature to achieve this. So the initial state plus the transactions go into an execution engine. And this is not just a normal computer, this is the decentralized execution engine, the entire set of systems that make up the entire network. It processes the transfer of the assets according to whatever rules are defined for that asset. And then of course this results in then in a final state where the final state is um, the new allocation of, of assets. So in this case, it could be Alice making a payment to Bob for 150. So ultimately, if we want to make this kind of system work at scale and be useful in the real world, we need this idea of an internet of value. This is a different kind of internet, or rather maybe an extension of the internet that builds in these capabilities so you can work with digital assets. So the kind of properties we want, we want it to be global, like the internet, it should be a worldwide network, it should be borderless, anyone should be able to access it from any location. It should be open. You want to make it possible that everyone can participate and join the network, which generally means it has to be neutral to um, who is using it, or uh, maybe it doesn't even know. Maybe you've got some pseudonymous ID identifiers that enable you to use it semi-anonymously. -anonym it's got to have a sense of automation. And automation is important for a couple of reasons. One, you want to be able to build smart contracts involving digital assets. But also, you can use smart contracts to actually implement the digital assets to define the rules by which the assets operate. We want it to be secure. So this really means using best-in-class cryptography so that you can be sure that only, your, only you can sign a transaction to use your own assets and that there aren't any security holes in these kind of, in these kind of situations. Um, I, I'd say it also needs to be extensible. If you build one of these networks that only supports three kinds of assets, it's not going to be much use. You want it to be possible for people to build all kinds of different solutions on top of this sort of platform. It's got to be fast, and you know that means realistic, real-world transaction volume, so something like you might see on a Visa network. And it's got to be cheap. If it's expensive to use, that's going to be a barrier to making, to making use of this in, in, in real economies. And what might you use it for? Well, there's literally thousands of, 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 of applications. Um, consumer applications, for one thing, is an area which I think is going to be very exciting over the next few years. One of the hot topics at the moment are non-fungible tokens. Someone recently sold an NFT for about $69 million, an artwork NFT, which is, you might say, is quite incredible, but it shows that these, these digital assets can have real values. You can use it for games, you can use it for banking solutions, you can use it maybe for social networking. There's a whole host of different consumer applications that can exist on these kind of decentralized systems. I think there's also a very important space around trust and identity. You can build uh, systems like autonomous organization, which are effectively companies that operate in an entirely virtual way and just use a system of incentives and payments to, uh, to interact with other, with other entities or with their users. Um, there's things like also self-sovereign identity and trusted credentials. How do you issue a credential that people can trust in a global sense? And then uh, 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 
have to obviously mention also like the decentralized finance applications. So these are things like uh, digital banking, uh, decentralized exchanges, central bank digital currencies, all super interesting areas. And I think we're seeing a lot of, a lot of innovation in the space and there's gonna be some big revolutions that change the way that the financial system operates using these kind of uh, uh, capabilities. And, you know, I think I agree with this quote from uh, John Tapscott that, you know, the blockchain, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say blockchain, but decentralized networks represent a second era of the internet. It's adding a fundamentally new capability, which enables these kind of value systems uh, to, to operate. I'll just pause very quickly. I mean, um, that's a quick overview of the digital asset space and why I, I personally think it's interesting. Are there any sort of thoughts or questions or, or, or comments on that? If not, I'll plow on. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about Convex. And Convex is a, a, a platform that we are, we are building at the Convex Foundation as an open platform for the Internet of Value, uh, which is, of course, a, a Java implementation. Um, I would define it as a, a, as a full stack IOV solution. So we, we're building a system that really goes from the, from the base layer, the, you know, the infrastructure we want to use, right up to what's ultimately interesting, which is the applications. So they can be mobile, they can be web, they can be enterprise systems or integrations with any kind of uh, uh, other backend systems that you might use. And in between, we have a couple of important layers. First of all, we have this base protocol layer. That is what actually enables the decentralized network to work. How does it actually agree to the consensus algorithm? How does it agree about the state of the digital assets? How does it agree which transactions have been executed and uh, which transactions have completed. And it also needs this, this convex virtual machine, which is effectively a virtual machine that runs on the network. And this is what is actually executing all the smart contracts, executing the transactions, and making sure that all the rules that people define for their digital assets get faithfully executed in a predictable, reliable way. And this actually, all the different machines at nodes in the network collaborate to make sure they've all got exactly the same answer. And this is obviously really important. You can't have some people thinking they own an asset and other people thinking that, they, that someone else owns the asset. And that, that would be a, a bit of a disaster. So this, is, this, is, this needs to be done in a very consistent way to get a global consensus. Now, on top of that, that substrate, um, there's then a bunch of services. So these are things like registries, some of the trust tools, various different kind of user libraries that you can use to, uh, to, 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 to generate the, the program code that you need. And um, what a typical uh, smart contract developer then would be doing is using those services to build their own business logic, whether it's smart contracts, whether it's the logic of their enterprise application, or whether it's a new kind of digital asset that they want to run on the system. And then the application layer is interacting with the network to access those digital assets and those smart contracts. And then everything else just, just goes, runs, operates down the, down the stack in a consistent, consistent way. So um, this is the kind of architecture that we believe is, 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 is going to be the future of these, of, these, of these systems. The substrate is something that the Convex Foundation uh, provides for everyone. But the top layer is totally open. Anyone can build any of these. There's, not, there's, there's nothing special. And you know, we've, we've got plenty of open source examples of, of these things and, and, and people building these, these sorts of applications. Um, I think what I think makes Convex special is um, uh, three things that it combines at the same time. One is the scalable performance that we can actually do internet scale uh, usage um, and you know, talking about thousands of transactions per second, the sort of scale that a Visa network would, would, would need to provide. Um, it has this concept also of universal transactions. So it is actually a global state model that the entire registry of digital assets and it is all updated in a single transactional operation. So if you swap one asset for another asset, there's never any danger of consistency. It all happens in a single atomic operation. And this is super important for consistency and it's super important for making sure that 
things don't go wrong halfway through a transaction and you don't get you don't get your side of the uh, of, of the exchange and, and and lose money and then the final the final the final area that's is super important as well is it is fully decentralized so people have been able to do smart contracts for decades but the novelty is really doing it fast and in a decentralized way so that you don't have a single central system being the arbiter to all of these transactions. It's actually running in a, in a, in a, in a truly open network that nobody owns. So kind of like uh, your Bitcoin or Ethereum that pioneered this space, but this is really giving performance and program, more programmability to, that, to those capabilities. And um, just a couple of benchmarks. So we're, we're, we're certainly running in tens of thousands of transactions per second range. Uh, Visa, I think, tip, I think Visa can do a lot more than this, but typically it's normally running at about, you know, a couple of thousand transactions per second. Ethereum and Bitcoin really cannot do many transactions per second, and they're really constrained on capacity for, for various different reasons. Um, and that's a big problem. It's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, there is a need for alternative ways of doing things compared to the, compared to the blockchains. Um, super important thing is confirmation time. If you're making a payment, or if you're playing a game, you don't want to wait a long time to confirm if that transaction went through. You want a quick response. So we've really put a lot of emphasis on getting the, the latency for a final digital asset confirmation down as quick as possible. And the final point, of course, is it's got to be cheap. If you want people to use it, particularly in consumer applications or retail applications, we need to make sure that it's, 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 it's very cheap to, to execute. And of course, having the performance helps because it means you can you can you can you can you can run a lot of transactions for for, for lower cost. Um, I don't want to talk too much about blockchain, but I just wanted to you know highlight a couple of issues with the blockchain approach, which which cause a challenge. Um, a key one is these blocks are mined sequentially. Whenever you build a block in a blockchain, you have to attach it uh, with a reference to the previous block. So you're always adding the blocks one at a time and you have to have this complex process for choosing who is going to mine the next block. And sometimes that results in burning a lot of energy like you would with Bitcoin and very wasteful algorithms. Um, but more importantly, you can't issue blocks concurrently uh, because you have to wait until the previous block is finalized before you can, you can add, add the next one. So this is a huge bottleneck on these, on these systems. And there's often a lack of clarity over actually which is the latest block. Is actually a new one that's come after, and you have to have various different complexities to deal with these, these sort of issues. Um, so Convex doesn't actually use a blockchain; it's a new kind of consensus algorithm, convergent proof of stake. I won't go into it too much detail, but basically, it's it's a it's a way of solving this this problem of how do you collect all of these transactions and, and, and execute them. Without, without so many bottlenecks and without so, some of the uh, some of the challenges that uh, that exist in the in the, in the blockchain in the blockchain operations. Um, a few things we're building with this. Um, so one product is a token factory. So if you wanted to make a token, let's say you want to make um, Air Miles token or something like that, um, how can you make it really easy for people to create and, and, and operate these tokens? Uh, preferably without writing any smart contract code because that's that's quite risky and quite security um, quite a, quite security uh, specialized and we want to make it super easy for people to do that with like ready-made templates um, we we built a decentralized asset exchange this lets you swap different kinds of assets so if you imagine swapping a digital currency for a uh, for your air miles or for some other kind of token this basically acts as a stock exchange for all of the different uh, tokens on the system. We have a non-fungible token engine as well. So you can create these unique non-fungible tokens to represent whatever you like. Um, but this might be artwork or it might be items in games. It might be uh, even identities or, or, or ownership of some other kind of um, uh, non-virtual non asset. And we're also building some banking technology. So. Um, uh, you know, a very interesting project to say, okay, what would it look like if a bank wanted to run some of its core systems on a decentralized uh, platform, which we think could be very interesting for, 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 for the, some of the innovative banks in the space. Um, and of course, we're 
huge focus on developer tools. So we have this live interactive sandbox so people can try out the, uh, the Nest network. We have a, a mobile app, digital wallet, so you can, you can use this to, uh, as a sort of typical user would do. So it's like a, an example of how you build a mobile application. Um, that's actually one of the few things which isn't in Java. That's actually a Flutter application, Google Flutter. We have then the, uh, the toolkit, so lots of open source libraries to help people build digital assets. And we have the peer server. So if you actually want to run a node in the network yourself, uh, you can. Although for most applications, you don't actually need to do that. But there might be some reasons you want to. For example, you might want to have a copy of the entire database so that you can do some quick analytics locally rather than doing some remote queries. So there's, there's some reasons why you might want to run a, run a peer server yourself. Um, NFT marketplace, um, just you know, quick, 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 quick shot of this. Um, and this is this is nice because it's a good example of different kinds of digital assets working together. So non-fungible tokens represent some kind of artworks, um, but you can buy them with other kinds of currencies. So for for US dollars or for convex coins or any other di digital digital token. Um, I'll do a quick. I think I've got time, so I'll do a quick. Yeah, sure. Should convex be called blockchain technology? Or does it use traditional blockchain methods? Um, I think it should not. It, it's very similar to a blockchain. Great question, by the way. Um, it's very similar to a blockchain in the sense that it is a decentralized system that executes transactions and has a decentralized ledger. It is different from a blockchain in the sense that the blocks are not chained together. Yeah, they've not got a pointer to the previous block. So that's the key difference. Convex does actually have a, set, a concept of a block, but they can be reordered up until the point that the consensus is finalized. And what that enables is people can concurrently create new blocks and then they all get ordered together. And then finally that order gets stabilized by the consensus algorithm. But there's no actual physical dependency or information dependency that causes those blocks to be, to be linked in a chain. So it's not technically a blockchain, but it's very similar in some of the ideas of what you can do with it. Um, I'll, just do a, I'll just do a super quick demo, actually, uh, of, the, of, of the app since we're here. Um, if this works, and my screen is too small, this is a tragedy, one sec. If I can quickly, quickly just get this running. Yeah, so this is, I'm just running here, a good old Android Studio, little Android emulator. Um, and this is what a, a mobile wallet might look like. Um, so we built a mobile wallet. You can see I've got um, some convex coins. Uh, I'm actually Alice at the moment. My account number is, is 559. Um, I can see what digital assets I've got. I've got 66 US dollars. I've got 10 pounds sterling, 10,000 Japanese yen. I created an INSEAD token, which I have a lot of. Um, if I want to, for example, buy some more Japanese yen, I can buy 100 Japanese yen. And I might want to buy it with my US dollars. So I've got some US dollars. That's going to cost me 92 cents. I buy 100 Japanese yen. And that's now I've got an extra 100, 100 yen in my, uh, in my, in my account. That's how quick the transactions go through. That is a full settlement. So that is not simply getting the confirmation for the transaction. The full supply chain is finished. So it's actually transferred the funds. So you, you might compare with the stock exchange, the actual settlement often comes at a time lag after the, uh, the trade is made. Here, the trade happens in a single transaction. So the transfer of the funds happens sort of instantaneously. Um, I can also see some of the NFTs that I own. So I've got a few NFTs here, um, some digital art that someone made that I quite like. And if I want to go and buy some more NFTs, there's an NFT shop. So uh, let's say I like this, the beginning, and I want to pay 10 US dollars for that. Again, I can just, I can just buy that asset and uh, it should now be in my should now be in my library. Yeah, there we are. Uh, the beginning. So 
you can see how you can use these kind of these kind of capabilities to build pretty nice, easy to use um, mobile applications and tools that work with uh, that work with these kind of virtual assets. Um, and, oh, there's also a tool. I won't go into it too much, but you can launch your own tokens. So if you actually want to create your own token, you can you can create your own your own currency. Um, there's an interesting idea about in the future will companies and individuals actually have their own individual currency. Uh, so it's a very interesting idea to explore what possibilities these kind of capabilities open up. And that wouldn't be practical on some of these blockchains because it's too slow, too expensive, but it would convert its, its, its sort of feasible uh, kind, of, kind of possibility. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, that's our mobile app. Um, and it's all open source. So if you want to play around with it and, uh, and sort of test out some of these, um, some of these tools, um, it's all there in Flutter and Android Studio. Lost my position in the presentation for a second. Sorry, it's not a technical issue here, one sec. It's apparently not going backwards, so you have to be very, very careful. Yeah. Yeah, sure. The question there? Uh, yes. How can we be sure that the network won't be attacked and why it's emptied by malicious actors? Uh, great question. Uh, um, I can't go too much into the consensus algorithm. I'd love to, but we just don't have time. But there's basically a, a, a threshold of how many peers in the network need to be uh, following the protocol in order for um, you to be completely safe from any interruptions. So it's about, it's two thirds consensus for the network to continue to operate normally. If a malicious actors got more than one third, they could potentially delay transactions, but they still couldn't rewrite transactions. So your transactions and your assets are still safe. It's still protected by the digital signature. Yeah, so liveness requires two thirds, um, and um, as as long as that's there, you're you're, you're basically one hundred percent safe. Um, if if uh, malicious actors get a large percentage of the network, they can potentially censor, block transactions, or do a few other things that disrupt the network. Um, but they still can't send your asset because they still can't sign a transaction with your private key. So as long as your private key is kept secure and you've got good key security, uh, your asset should be safe. Be a very important point, critical to all of this. Get involved. I have more questions, but I think we can do that. Okay. Okay. Um, what, what, what interesting idea um, is that every account on the Convex network, whenever you create one, is in fact a fully fledged compute environment. You basically get your own little virtual computer. You can define your own code, your own definitions in this in this environment, and. Um, this is protected again by your digital signature, so only you can change things in your environment, um, which is uh, which is very important. 
Um, and there's actually two types of accounts. User account, which is one that a user has created and is using to, um, is using to uh, you know, either write code or execute transactions or manage their own assets. Or you can also have actor accounts, which don't have any user, they're fully automated and they're just operating according to smart contract rules. So you'd use an actor to implement a system that executes smart contracts. So for example, if you, the shop that I just demonstrated where you buy NFTs from, that is an actor. It holds those assets in its warehouse until someone buys them. It takes the money, pays the own, original owner of the asset and gives the asset to the, uh, the purchaser. So all of those rules are in a smart contract and they basically get executed according to that, that logic. And that's another kind of account. They're actually very similar. The only difference is can a user execute transactions against that account? Um, a bit of technical magic, um, you know, getting into the nitty gritty. We do actually have an on-chain compiler. So we actually compile uh, code to a sort of um, a sort of bytecode format, but smart contracts can actually generate that bytecode and actually compile and execute it on-chain, which is a, quite a powerful capability. And that lets us do some quite funky things, like you could have a single line of code that actually calls some other smart contracts and does code generation to build a digital asset. So we provide these template digital assets that basically just do code generation and compile a full digital asset that then other people can, can use. Now we have uh, trust monitors. So we have quite a sophisticated trust model. So obviously your accounts are protected by digital signature, but you might want to do something a bit fancier. You might want to have a whitelist of like which users have the admin rights to your shop. Um, these kind of things this is what the trust model is all about. Um, we have these upgradable contracts so that you can you can live, and this is dangerous, but there is facilities if you want to like live upgrade smart contracts or upgrade the code, um, you can add that capability in, obviously use at your own risk because um, it's a slightly dangerous feature, but um, uh, it's it's powerful capability for people who want to continue upgrading and continue enhancing their smart contracts. We have a, a fancy storage engine. We realized that to get this level of performance, we actually had to build our own storage engine. So it was very, very specialized for the kind of data structures that are needed. And um, we do that, in fact, using the uh, Java mapped memory, so mapped byte buffers. And that gives us very fast disk access um, um, uh, random access and lets us get to like, you know millions of reads per second and you know quite a lot of writes per second both of which are critical for the high transaction throughput and then we also have this system of memory accounting which is quite interesting there's like a, a memory quota for each account you can buy more whenever you need but what this does is it, it stops it creates an incentive for people to be efficient with memory space and um, you don't want people to be just allocating gigabytes of data on chain because that's going to slow everyone else down and it's going to cost people money and it's you know it's not a good use of the network resources so we, we basically create this very strong incentive for people to keep their code uh, as small as possible and that is consistent with the vision of the internet of value you want all of the smart clever stuff the graphics the user interface the uh, um the the big resource hungry uh, ex uh, computations you want to run that yeah, on different systems, on the various different systems, whether it's client or the enterprise servers or app servers, you're still going to need those to build up to, to do the heavy lifting. You want to use the internet of value, the smart contracts, and the on chain uh, computation literally to do the transactions that everyone needs to see and everyone needs to trust. And that's all you need to do. Yeah. So the core is very focused on that. You want to discourage people from putting heavy computation on, on, on the uh, So I'll go into a bit then of, 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 of man, a bit more of the Java side, which is uh, you know, ultimately, ultimately, ultimately really important. And, and we really do love Java and the JVM uh, um, at the Convex Foundation. Uh, a few reasons that I think are particularly important. One, we get all these great libraries. So the crypto algorithms, these really state-of-the-art crypto algorithms available in Java, which um, you know, are in no danger of being uh, hacked anytime soon, probably not for a few hundred years. We get things like NIO, which gives us amazing networking performance, uh, all the open source tools that like parsing. Uh, so just a great ecosystem of, 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 of capabilities to build, to build convex. Um, garbage collection is super important. And 
uh, I could talk for hours about this. Um, if you have immutable data structures where you can't mutate them, you've got to have these big things that are trusted and they've been verified. Um, these perform really badly if you have to copy the whole thing. You have to have different pointers and you have to have different data structures sharing the lower parts of the tree or large branches of the tree. So actually what these are are uh, directed acyclic graphs. Now, it is really hard to make these perform well unless you have a really good garbage collector. So the Java GC actually is critical to make this um, efficient. And the other thing that goes along with this is this idea of soft references. So I don't know how many of you use soft references in Java, but it basically references that if, if you start running low on memory, they can be deleted, they can be garbage collected. And it does this in a safe way. And the reason we need this is because many of these data structures are actually going to be bigger than memory. Yeah, if you imagine the entire state of the entire convex virtual machine with maybe millions of accounts and, 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 and thousands of digital assets and, uh, and lots of transactions going through this, you're not actually going to fit this in memory on a single machine. So we use soft references so that the garbage collector can get rid of stuff that we're not currently using. And if we do need that data, we can always put it back in again from storage. And soft references really give us this capability. And then, of course, the general JVM is performance is great. So we can do a lot of um, we could do a lot of uh, get a great runtime performance out out of it. In fact, the the performance bottlenecks are more the crypto algorithms rather than the code execution speed on the JVM. So it's never been a uh, never been a never been a problem for us. And tools like JMH um, is very useful to help us just improve this performance. Um, we have a, actually a Lisp, uh, a language uh, on Convex, um, which is uh, sort of the native smart contract language. We can compile other things to, to, to the CVM, but this is sort of the most natural language to use. And if anyone is familiar with Clojure, it is very much inspired by the Clojure language, which is a great, another great JVM language. And these compile down to the sort of the raw CVM operations. We actually have another experimental compiler, which looks more like JavaScript. And we may someday make something that's a bit more like Java. And that's probably a bit, a bit of a, not a great fit for the, um, uh, the CVM itself. Uh, it's more of an implementation language for the, C, for the CVM. Um, so we have a Java client library. And um, I'll go and, I'll go and sh 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 show some of these things. Um, uh, but there's a few key classes that, that we use. So we have a convex class that represents a connection to the network, handles all the security for you, um, kind of how you'd expect. We have sort of synchronous and async modes, so you can have a feature if you want to uh, buy off a transaction and wait a couple of seconds, the results come back. You might want to get on and do other things in the meantime. So that's a very useful feature. We have a token builder. So um, generating, you want to generate your own digital tokens. And we have a fungible, a fungible asset class that basically is what you interact with when you're using a fungible token. So if you want to check your balance or transfer to other, other people. And this is a convex Java library up on GitHub has one of these classes. I would caveat that it's still in active development. We might change the API a bit still, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite fun to play with. Um, so I'll just, I'll just drop in and actually show a bit of code here. Um, Got my my beloved Eclipse, which I've been a, a user for many years. Um, and for some reason, it is not letting me click on, on Eclipse. Okay. I have to do it the old fashioned way with keyboard. So I just put together a quick, uh, a quick sort of a demo of, of, of what application code using convex might look like. Um, so we have, um, first of all, just a quick URL just to say who we want to connect to. So this is the convex.world testnet server. Because we, we're going to be transacting on the network, we actually need to generate a key pair. So in this case, I'm just generating a new. Uh, a new key pair, it's using the Java secure random basically, and then the, the Java cryptography libraries to generate a ED25519 key pair, which is what we use for digital signatures. So if we actually look at the code, what we're going to do is, um, first of all, we're going to um, connect to our 
this peer, so we want to get an actual connection. Um, bit of print in to say check what's going on. Um, we're then going to actually create a new account. So um, creating an account is going to use our key pair and uh, build a new account on the network. We send a request to be allocated a new account. And we also need some convex coins. Um, so in order to transact on the network, there's a, like a utility coin that you use to pay for computation or for memory. So we just request some of those. They're free on the test on the test net. Um, so we're getting 10 million just in case. And we're setting up then our, our network to use uh, the address we've just created and the uh, and the key pair we've just uh, just created. You could actually switch, you could actually work with multiple addresses if you if, if you want. We're just going to use one in this case. Um, so then we're going to actually we're going to create a new token. So we have a token builder. Uh, so we create a new token builder. And one of the parameters you, you can optionally provide, provide to the token builder is saying, okay, how many tokens do you want to exist in the entire universe for your new token? So we're doing 999 million. And then we're going to uh, deploy the, the token and we're going to get back a fungible instance. The fungible instance lets us interact now with the token um, that's, been, that's been deployed. We just confirm that that exists. And then just to check that it's all working, we're going to see, okay, well, what's, what's, our, what's our balance? How many tokens do we, do, do, do we now own in the network? So just a short example, but just a you know, quick, quick uh, illustration. Um, so let me, just, let me just run this. For some reason, Zoom is messing up my. Does anyone know the key, the key press for fun? Okay, so I'm just going to run this. So we're connecting to convex.world. Um, So oh, I think that's worked anyway. So um, we're getting the, 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 the output coming through. So we requested convex coins. We created our fungible token. So with an address um, 998. And the balance for 997, which would be the account that we just created. And we got 999 million tokens in that, in that, uh, in that account. So actually, the whole thing ran in just a couple of seconds, just this executing these transactions on the network. What I should be able to show, if this is working, um, is we have in the convex.world, this is the testnet site, we should be able to see that some new transactions have just come through. So we can see that uh, a few 59 seconds ago, uh, account 997 ran a transaction on the network. Let me just, let me just see what happened. And what it did is it executed this code to build um, to build and, uh, and launch this new token. And that token result was nine nine eight, which is a which is an actor, so it's a smart contract on the network. And if I go into the accounts and I look at nine nine eight, you can actually see the code that was generated to implement the different features of this of this smart contract. So how does it check the how do you check the balance? How do you make a transfer? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all the code that you need for a fungible token that has been created and deployed, uh, deployed, to, deployed to the network. And you can actually do the same thing here with a sandbox. So there's a live sandbox. If you want to code the same, the same kind of things, you know, you can just execute any, any commands in here and, and run, run them in the same, in the same, in the same way. Um, so the display's a bit messed up, but um, you know, all of that sort of available in sort of a live, live coding environment. Okay, so um, that was all the uh, quick demo I, I had had to do. Let me just move this. Um, um, so yeah, so that's about it. Um, so I hope you found hope you found that interesting. Um, we do have a Discord server. Um, if anyone wants to, anyone wants to join the discussions, find out more. We're you know we're 
a lot of interesting technical discussions about the libraries we're building, how we're building these kind of tools and impacting on the, uh, the, the, this kind of technology. So if that interests anyone, do come, do come along and join that. And obviously, you know, you can explore the uh, developer website and sandbox if you want to actually play with the live, live network. And uh, it is an open project, so all contributors, you know, very welcome to come in and, uh, and and get involved. And you know, we do we will be allocating convex goals to people who make contributions to the to the, to the system. So that's how we that's how we get the convex gold out there in the first place. So anyone wants to earn some cryptocurrency, it's a good way to good way to do it. Um, so um, thank you very much. Hope that's interesting, and uh, obviously happy to take any take any questions. Yes, I think you have a few questions in the comments section. Let me just I'm just gonna stop the share. Okay. It's driving me mad. Okay, so um I think the answered network won't be attacked. It's a, it's a Schumacher where the question should be. Yeah. Uh, so uh, from from Boba Fett, I think was first. Why are you showing memory size on a user app? Um good question. I mean the user app is Currently, it's an example app which we mostly use for testing and demos. So developers want to see some of these kind of things. Um, I think for a regular end user, you probably wouldn't show it unless there was a reason why a user might be consuming a lot of memory. Like if they're creating a lot of NFTs or something, maybe they consume a lot of memory for, for that and they might want to know how much they're using. Um, so um, probably not normally necessary, but it's an option. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Um, so for the demo, um, where are the assets stored and where does the convex engine run? So it's actually a hybrid system. So um, the, the images for the NF. I assume this is talking about the NFTs, but it probably applies to more of the different uh, uh, different, different digital assets as well. The image regular web servers. Um, so any image URL can be provided um, to um, uh, to visualize your assets. It could also be you know video, it could be any kind of any kind of content. And that's true for consumer applications. It's probably also true for business content. Yeah, if you imagine you have contracts, you probably wouldn't be uploading the contract text themselves to, to, the, to, the, to the online system. You would be maybe storing a hash so that you would, uh, you would keep the contract itself in some secure storage somewhere. Um, the Convex engine is running on a network of uh, peer nodes. I think they're actually in Europe at the moment, um, but that's the decentralized system. So the convex virtual machine is basically being operated by different peers on the network. And the one we connected to is the convex.world one. Um, but in the in the main network, there could be maybe hundreds of these peers around the world that would be executing the same code and um, uh, verifying that all the other peers are behaving correctly according to the according to the protocol. But I think the future is definitely hybrid applications. You'll have you know normal client side code, you'll have the on-chain uh, CBM code, and you'll also have backend systems that are acting as traditional app servers. And I think that hybrid model is probably the way that um, uh, is, 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 is going to uh, is going to develop. Um, so Obi Jerome, um, our consensus algorithm is part of Convex. Uh, yes, um, there is the convergent proof. Of Oh, uh, we are coming back. Uh, so, Mike, uh, you can uh, come here. Uh, we can uh, we can continue here. Uh, 
Hey there. So sorry. Yeah, some technical uh, technical issues on my laptop there. Um, consensus algorithm is part of convex. So yes, there is a consensus. Um, could you choose between different consensus algorithms before creating your 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 coin or your digital asset? I, um, I think I think you kind of have to have the network running on the same consensus algorithm. So ultimately, all of the peers need to be running the same consensus algorithm in order you get this agreement on the global state or the allocation of uh, digital digital assets. So um, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's possible to have a choice of different consensus algorithms as such. There might be some ways to participate in a consensus algorithm. So for example, you can potentially place a stake on one of the peers and maybe earn some rewards by staking on a good peer who behaves well. So there are a few interesting ways that you can interact with the consensus algorithm. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the, the network kind of has to pick one consensus algorithm and, and run with that um, rather than having a, a set of different choices. Um, is that all the questions? Uh, yes. This one was the last one. Was from. Cool, awesome. Well, some oh. great, great questions. Um, oh, ca one more question. Can you set up closed systems for a company and possibly allow other links? Uh, yes, this is actually this is actually quite interesting. So, theoretically, you could run, you know, just a, a private instance of of convex if you wanted to. Um, I would say that if you were to do that you'd be losing a lot of the advantages of having this sort of decentralized network and this global this ability to do global transaction with 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 anyone in the world it would just be for whoever's got access to that particular system so yes it's possible i mean there are people do, who do private blockchains and these are popular in in some in some areas but i think they're fundamentally quite limited you know it's more like building little private network what rather than using the internet so it's kind of a different Different sorts of sorts of use cases, but yeah, it's certainly a possibility. And you know, we've got some we've got some people wanting to do that already with Convex. Okay, awesome, great. Well, th thanks for the great questions. Thank you. I think Jeremy would like to share your frame map of the. I'm very excited to see this picture. No, <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you all. Uh, here is a, a little, a little something on the, which has been built uh, during the uh, during the time. Um, I, if you still have some question, I'm sure uh, Mike will be able to answer it. And actually, uh, we are all happy. To have you there today and hope you enjoy the presentation and do not hesitate to subscribe to the meetup group and speak if you didn't like it speak to it to your friends and if you liked it uh, do the same <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone thanks everyone it was nice to have you you are more than welcome you can disconnect and have a real life thank you Bye. Bye.